another edition of the Best Real Estate Investing Advice Ever show via Facebook Live. If you have any questions that you want answered, then go ahead and comment below and we will get to them either on this episode or the next episode. That being said, you ready to rock and roll? Let's do it, Joe. Okay. Best ever listeners, how you doing? Welcome to the Best Real Estate Investing Advice Ever show. I'm Joe Fairless. This is the world's longest running daily real estate investing podcast. We only talk about the best advice ever. We don't get into any of that fluffy stuff. Today's Friday. We do follow on Friday today. And for those episodes, got my co-host Theo Hicks on those episodes. How you doing, Theo? Doing great, Joe. How you doing? I'm doing well. And, well, follow along Friday for anyone who hasn't heard the show before, well, first off, welcome, uh, and for any returning Best Ever listeners, as a refresher, this is about what we've learned uh, over the past week, so that what we've learned can perhaps help you out in what you've got going on in your entrepreneurial endeavors, and we've got a lot going on right now, um, so Theo, let's kick it off. Let's do it, so we'll start with some, some deal updates, so you, you, I know you've got a new, a new deal under contract. Yes, we uh, have been awarded a new deal. Okay, it's Award not deal. not yet under contract. We went. It's an on market deal that we have been looking at for quite some time, and we've gone. We've been awarded it through the process. So when an, you know off market deal, it's a lot more simple. On market, it's more um, uh, a little bit strung out more because mm -hmm. there's bids and then everyone bids and then you go into the best and final round, you give your best and final offer, you usually have a call with the broker and the uh, representative from the seller. They qualify you, basically make sure that you can close and that nothing will come up from a, you know, a due diligence standpoint that, they, that could kill the deal. Um, and then they'll try and push you a little bit to put a little bit more, to pay a little bit more. <laughs> uh, and then eventually they award the winner. And we have been awarded the deal. So this uh, will be the 11th deal that we wow. have in our portfolio. Uh, and we know this, this deal and in particular this market and sub market incredibly well. Uh, we have almost a thousand units within two miles mm -hmm. from this property. Uh, so as we continue to go through the process, I, I don't want to talk a whole lot about it because it's not under contract yet. Um, but once we have it under contract, then you know, I'll tell you more about the business plan and everyone more about the business plan, um, etc. So yeah, got awarded a, a new deal, excited about that, and where we're at right now in the process is uh, working through the purchase and sale agreement, the PSA, uh, with the seller and then also um, I am getting the uh, investor presentation ready just to share mm -hmm. uh, with them um, and then I'll probably be doing that mm, late this week early next week and then we'll have a conference call with investors talk to them about the opportunity why we're buying it and then we'll be off and running should close by the end of august okay is the time frame so when, when, when you're awarded a deal prior to having any other contract is that like a, a verbal agreement or is yeah. it something that's written down it's verbal okay yeah um so that's why in 99 percent it's gonna happen uh, but there's always a chance that something crazy might happen. That's why I'm a little um, cryptic in how I talk <laughs> about it until we get it under contract. But um, for all intents and purposes, we we're it's it's our deal. Okay, I was wondering because for for smaller deals, I'm trying to think if there's a, some a comparable something an, an analogous to being a war the deal. I guess it'd be. You submitting the offer and them saying, yeah, we'll get to it tomorrow or we'll yeah. sign the contract tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It could say, oh, well, congratulations, you were the bid that they selected. Mm -hmm. And then for whatever reason, they decide to go a different direction okay. and put, put it under contract with someone else. I mean, ultimately, unless it's under contract, yeah. it doesn't, doesn't really mean anything. So, 
Awesome. Well, congratulations. Yeah. One thing you could do is have an LOI uh, signed by both parties, and I've heard situations where that has held up in court, where where mm -hmm. you both sign the LOI and say we plan on getting a PSA purchase and sale agreement agreed upon by you know, t two weeks from today, and and then if it's not, then it's then it's not. But if it is, then or within those two weeks, if they go to another buyer, then I have seen uh, in a, a court um, proceeding where the seller was forced to sell to the original buyer, uh, even even though they didn't have a contract, but they had to sign the LOI mm -hmm. in place. Okay. Um, so you know that 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 could be one way that you could tie it up, um, but ultimately, as I've said many times, everyone loses when attorneys are involved. Yeah. <laughs> so you know if they don't want to sell it to you, then I, yeah, I, I would probably just say okay, it's not not the right thing. Finding the deal. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, a couple updates on on my deal. So yeah, are you closed? You so we're supposed to close. Today, actually. Oh. But we extended the contract to the 31st because of Good. things on the... the so they, they, yes. signed, they signed the contract. Okay. Well, so, well, so it, actually, it's funny because you're saying how you were awarded the deal and, and yeah. had the contract. I've been awarded the extension, but they still, I, I, they still haven't signed it yet. They keep saying how we'll sign it tomorrow, we'll sign it tomorrow. Oh, so they we'll haven't see. signed it yet. We'll see what happens. Um, when do they have to sign it by? Well, there was, uh, I'm not sure if there's a specific date, but I'm, I'm sure they should have to sign it by today. Well, when's the contract We're expired? supposed to today. Like, so, we're, we're supposed so, to close today. <laughs> so, it needs, so the contract goes until today. So they need to sign mm -hmm. it today. Yeah. And they, and they, I mean, they, and they, they verbally agreed to sign it, but they didn't mean anything. Via email? Email. Yeah. Email. Okay, so they emailed and said, yes, we agree to it. And when was that? It was yesterday. Oh, okay. Yesterday, we're, we're on what yeah. time? It's because they're on, it's because they're all, the agents were on vacation, and they said okay. we'll do it when we get back. Okay. And right. my, my my agent's on vacation too, and yeah, it's I, I it, there's a lot of I've, I've run into a lot of interesting situations with agents this round, so I'm not sure <laughs> what I'll be using agents moving forward. You but, are an agent. I am an agent. Yes. So, I'm, so I'm, don't I'm, use uh, them. You're you could you could double up on some stuff. I could, and I, I'm probably gonna pull that my my license from the. I guess the ashes, because right now it's in, it's up right now, they sent it back to the, the headquarters oh, okay. up in Columbus, is because I didn't want to keep continuing to pay like the $1,000 a year, because I wasn't necessarily using it, but now that I'm back in the game, it's worth probably it. yeah. survive that. It's worth it. Um, so I guess that's, you know, one, if we're, if we're talking about mistakes, that's one mistake that I don't want to repeat next time, which is uh, in regards to, to agents, and just, you know, is, is, it, is, it, is it worth going through all the headaches of having your own agent? With the benefits of not having to do the paperwork versus mm -hmm. just kind of just doing the paperwork you're out yourself and having the extra money and not having the headache of having to rely on someone else and kind of taking control of everything so that's probably what we'll do moving forward um but the good news about the deal so moving forward you will represent yourself i think so okay. yeah <laughs> i think so i think this is a sign yeah i should be representing myself yeah okay um, but there's there's two pieces of of good news about the deal number one the appraisals came back at ten thousand dollars over the, uh, the purchase price, which is which is good, because we were kind of we had a, a contingency in there, because we were kind of we were afraid that the appraisals wouldn't come back at the two twenty mark, just because just when we were in the comps, there weren't any any comps that were over two hundred thousand dollars, but there wow. were multiple sales in the past couple of months that were high enough that our property appraised for two our, our properties appraised for for two thirty, so we got thirty thousand dollars in equity. Um, over the three properties, ten, the ten above each property. Yeah, ten each. Okay, that's and great. So, and something that's even better is uh, the, the 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 business plan was to go into each property and raise the rents to um, not necessarily like market rates, but to the rates that we knew we can get based off of um, a one one bedroom and one two bedroom that was uh, leased in the actual in the property we're buying. And so for the one bedroom it was six hundred a month, and for the two bedroom it was seven fifty. And so we plan on going in there and raising all the one beds to 600 and the two beds to 750 because all the leases were month to month besides those two. But I, someone that I, I believe he used to go to the um, the mastermind group, Zach, and he, but he, he, he I think he's like doing a uh, a road trip right now in a in a, in a tractor in a trailer. You yeah. Know what I'm about? Yep. Uh, he owns a property there and he just got uh, 875, I believe, wow. for a two bed. 
which is, I believe it's the exact, because all the two beds are, all the, all the four plexes in Pleasant Ridge are, are all the same that I've seen. They all look the exact same. And so I know it's the same layout. I think he might have a couple of additional updates. I'm not 100% sure. But I mean, that's $125 over what I thought I could get. Yeah. So that's a huge, that's a huge that's plus. huge. Yeah. Yeah, that's huge. That's, what, a thousand over, uh, let's say, 1200 bucks plus a year. Yeah. And right now, the rents for the two beds are, I would say, on average, around 675 Wow. So. Wow. That, that's that's, that's a great that. bit, of, bit of news. I, I would definitely go tour if he'll allow you. Just go mm -hmm. check out his place and do a comparison. Yeah. Have you gotten into the units that the keys never worked? Yeah, I've got in there. You got in there. <laughs> got in there what did you find? No, they were. It was the exact same. There was no, oh, okay. there was no issues. Oh, okay. They were just. I, I think it, it was just the keys were were, were different. The, the tenants replaced the, okay. the locks. Um, so yeah, there's nothing hidden in there. There are no bodies or no Good. broken floors or anything like that. I was picturing a hoarder with dead things all around <laughs> and trash piled up to your knees. Okay, cool. Good. Yeah. Well, no, there was one unit that was a hoarder, and well, we, well, we saw it, and she was actually there too. But it was kind of it was, uh, it was a weird situation because it wasn't like your typical hoarder. She like she like uh, collects the, like dolls, <laughs> like uh, Barbies and Star Wars characters. She had a room that was just covered. And these action figures. <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> so that's you walk funny. in, they're all staring at you. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> you follow us around like we should like, we're gonna steal one of your action figures. I'm like, I'm not taking your dolls, don't worry. <laughs> you're, you're, you're being watched. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, so you had a lot more good news than than anything. That's great mm -hmm. on on those. And remind me and perhaps the best of listeners, are you getting one loan for those three properties or three separate loans? Three separate loans. Three separate loans. Got it. And are you, who are you working with? Not maybe the person, but the like the organization or the lender. It's called guaranteed rate. Oh right, right, yeah, yeah. So it seems that this as if they're a hybrid of a like a, like a traditional lender, like a Bank of America, yeah. or a PNC, and like a community bank, just because they. It, it, they seem like they, they underwrite the deals a little bit different than like how a PNC would, because they actually take into account the, the income um, uh, of the property when they're mm -hmm. kind of calculating or the income ratio. Where like, I, I, from as far as I can understand, uh, traditional banks don't do that. They have you to wait two years of uh, of income before they start saying, okay, now we'll take a hundred percent of income. Whereas for this lender, um, from my understanding, they take seventy five percent of the income. Uh, right away, boom, right when they're writing the deals right now. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, we use them, Colleen and I use them to buy our primary residence. Oh, awesome. Guaranteed rate. Cool. Okay, good stuff. Awesome. So I kind of went over my mistake already. So do, do you have any mistakes oh, you made this week? Oh, uh, let's see. Of course I have mistakes I made this week. <laughs> um, let's see. One is I, it, it is taking me way too long to finish one book. I have had on... I have finished it last night. I finished Perfect. it, uh, but I have had on my monthly goal for the last three months to read. Well, three months ago it was to read one book, and then two months ago it was to read two books, and then last month it was just to read one book, and I still hadn't completed one book, and it's freaking ridiculous uh, because I'd start some and then I would just trail off and I go start another, and then I wouldn't read at all. Um, I have finally finished it. It's the book called Priceless, The Myth of Fair Value and How to Take Advantage of It by William Poundstone. And I, I don't know how, how I came across it, you know, because anytime either a best ever uh, guest or someone I come across says, hey, this book is good, then I'll just immediately buy it. And then, you know, I'll read or Tim Ferriss or someone. Mm -hmm. um, the book is about, well, I've, I've talked about it briefly on another show, um, but the main takeaway is anchoring is real. So oh, yeah. when, you know, when you say, um, my, I want to sell my house for $3 million, but the house is worth $300,000, that's a bit ridiculous, but there is some portion that automatically elevates the real value of the house to a higher level and you will likely 
get um, more money for it. And what it's led me to think about is right now with apartments in particular, all of the properties we come across are priced to be determined by market. They don't have an actual sales price. And it goes absolutely against what all these psychologists and sociologists uh, talk about in this book, and that is you don't do it determined determine by market, you actually set the price, even if it's ridiculous. Let's so say you have an apartment community worth $600,000 and you, you want to get $600,000, set it for $850,000. And then you'll, you'll um, according to this book, it, 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 you'll get the top dollar you possibly can for it. Um, and you know, I, I talked about some other examples on previous shows where um, some high-end jewelry store do you know one? I can't think of one right now. No, I, I heard of one. I think it was in the book Influence. I think he wrote about, by uh, Robert Caldini, I think one of the examples, because he was also talking about that anchoring technique. He might have called something differently. But he was saying how you know, some jeweler couldn't sell this specific stone, and it was listed like half the price of some other stone that was like selling off the, off the hook. And then they like mis <laughs> they mistake, I think someone mistakenly doubled the price or added a zero out of the price. Mm, yep. And then I think it was I think someone mistakenly added a zero out of the price of this non seller and then it just yep. so, uh, sold out in basically instantaneously. Insane. Yeah, it's yeah, I remember that example. I, I I can't remember what book that was, but yep. Same same principle. And sometimes you need that stone with the extra zero, even if it doesn't sell, to then lift up your sales for other stuff. And this is what I talked about last time, like you go into uh, Gucci, and I don't know if they sell jewelry or not, but just say you go into <laughs> Gu Gucci, I think they just sell purses, uh, and there's a big like diamond, Gucci diamond, I'm pretty sure they don't have diamonds, but whatever, grow with me on this, <laughs> and they that never sells, but they know it won't sell because the purpose of it is to then make the sunglasses and other things not seem as expensive. So takeaway for real estate investors, one, uh, don't do price determined by market, Mm -hmm. do an actual sales price. Uh, two would be if you have um, a portfolio that you're selling, then maybe have one of the deals within the portfolio to be astronomically higher than what it should be, and then the others will then be risen up to a certain extent to that, uh, higher than they would have been without that anchoring point. Um, Another very tactical thing is have a mirror. If you work from home, have a mirror in your office because uh, it, studies have proven that when you're more self-aware, you're going to be more productive and ethical, by the mm -hmm. way, uh, because it's like someone's watching you and you're more self-aware. So have a mirror in your office and you'll just naturally be more self-aware because there you are and you'll be on the ball a little bit more. It could help with your productivity. Are you going to put a full, a full mirror here? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 who knows? I don't know. I might. I might. I, 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 gotta, I, gotta, I have a full mirror near my office, so I wonder if that's helping me or not. There you go. Yep. Uh, something else, I guess, uh, this is, I think this is kind of related. Um, not necessarily price-wise, but um, I guess relationship-wise in, in terms of anchoring. But uh, you interviewed Pat Hillban, I think is his name, on a, on a recent podcast, and I, actually, I think it was released last week. And he wrote the book Six Steps to Seven Figures, and I think it was step five was was build. He was talking about building off of, of previous success, and um, but but something that went out when I was reading that I thought about, and I think he mentioned this about you was how you how you, you anchor yourself to your your past successes. Um, to, to, to essentially elevate yourself whenever you're presenting yourself to, to new guests. And so you say, you know, hey, come on. My, somebody's saying, hey, come on my podcast. Or, say, or, hey, come invest with me. You say, you know, hey, I've got, you know, I interviewed Robert Kiyosaki and Barbara Corcoran and Emmett Smith on, on my podcast. You know, come, you know, be, come, come join that group. Or, hey, come invest with me. I've got this much in, in, in real estate already. And I go, oh, wow, the guy's, you know, legit. He's got, it kind of adds a layer of credibility. So I think that's kind of similar where he was, that was basically saying you want, to, you want to anchor yourself to to past successes, rather than kind of just starting from scratch and not mentioning anything you've done in the past and just saying, you know, hey, come invest with me, hey, come do this, come do that. So yeah. I think they, they, they might kind of be related, maybe not, but I wanted to mention that. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, you want to um, 
you want to have credibility and you have credibility by showing what you've done and but really because it's such a noisy world we get all sorts of inundated with all sorts of stuff it's about why should I listen or be involved with you mm -hmm. and that's what I do anytime I present at a conference or somewhere I always mention briefly my credentials because it's it helps you know my credibility whenever I'm talking to people and ultimately the main thing is interviewing over a thousand real estate investors because it's not necessarily my experiences although I am a full-time active real estate investor it's about the experiences of a thousand other people I've learned from while interviewing them awesome cool so let's let's transition so we've got we've got three questions uh, two from listeners and one actually from from me I guess you can call <laughs> me a listener okay but I would, you know we had you know, 4th of July, Independence Day, and we, we have a, a, a blog about the four steps of financial independence um, on, the, on, the, the, on Joe's blog. And I was thinking, because my, my idea when I invested in real estate was, you know, all, the, the reason I got into real estate was for the idea of financial independence. So I could, you know, invest in real estate, have, get enough income from real estate to cover my expenses or cover my, you know, at that point, what I was making on my full-time job. And then at that point, once I make it, I can just boom, stop. Don't they do anything anymore? I can go to a beach or I can go on vacation, kind of do do whatever. And I guess my question to you, based off of you know all the interviews that you've done, is is not necessarily how how realistic that is. Obviously, it's it's possible you can actually achieve that and you know replace your income. But how many people do you know that once they get to that point, do they actually do that or do they kind of just continue on and it's more of a financial freedom where they kind of don't have to worry about money anymore. Now they can just worry about expanding their business. Or, or doing something else? Well, I'd say the high achievers naturally want to continue to grow because that's how they got to where they're at. That's how, that's how they've achieved what they've achieved because they uh, know how to play the game and have played it well and want to continue playing because it is playing to them. It's not working. It's playing to them. Uh, so, you know, with real estate, it's not like stocks, because with stocks, you can set it up and forget about it. You really, I mean, well, you, I'm sure you want to manage your, you want to look at your portfolio as, as you go along, but it, it's, there's more handholding, there's more management involved with real estate. Uh, maybe a triple net lease. That might be one, that, that, that or, um, maybe le leasing land or, or something like that. But there's, gonna, there's always going to be some involvement in our investments. I mean, I, I'm at the you know, same place. I've, I've got a, a large amount of real estate, and it's just about continuing to grow and optimize my, my potential. And it's not just optimizing potential in real estate or business. It's about personal relationships, physical health. And so the people who do achieve financial uh, independence and uh, what was the other term you used? Freedom. Freedom. I mean, to me, financial independence, financial freedom, it's kind of semantic. It's splitting hairs. I mean, ultimately, the question is, once you have enough money, do you continue to work or do you go retire on the beach? That's basically the question. And I, I found that you continue to work, but it's not necessarily work. It's, it's stuff that you enjoy doing and you want to continue to achieve at a high level. And there was something I read that Grant Cardone wrote, and it was about how do, you, how do people work for 100 hours a week and not get burnt out? And the answer is, well, if it's work, you will get burnt out. But if it's something that you're enjoying doing, then you, d you don't get burnt out. You need to figure out how to integrate that into other things in your life, but you don't get burnt out because you're enjoying doing it. So you gotta, you got to really thrive off of doing what you do. And I think the key is to, um, as you go along in your financial career, you know, the ladder, you climb the ladder, to identify more and more of what you really enjoy doing uh, so what aspect of the business is the play part versus what aspect is the, the work part? And then building people and or building systems and teams around you who help you with the work part. 
Uh, I, I don't plan on retiring on the beach somewhere um, because that's I, I don't I go to the beach now and I just sit there for ten minutes and that's it. Like I want to go play volleyball. I want to go in the water. I want to go do bike rides and stuff. Um, and so then the question is, do you plan on going to retire on vacation permanently? Not, I, I would feel uh, I'd feel worthless. And perhaps that's something more deep that we need to discover. But I, I just constantly need to, you know, be um, contribute. And there's tons of ways to contribute. Uh, but when, as long as I'm continuing to grow my business, I know there's a ripple effect of really positive things with a lot of people. And why not continue to optimize that? And I think that's what most people, most higher achievers, realize. As they go along, you know, Tony Robbins, Oprah, uh, Elon Musk, they're not, they, they could retire, they could stop working, but then what? I mean, statistics show when you retire after you've worked and you're, you don't have a focus, you die in like five, seven years for males in particular. Mm -hmm. So why, why do that? Um, so I think, I think the image of going to retire on the beach is nice. Uh, but it's it's not correct, and if you do, you'll probably die within five to ten years, especially if you're a male. Yeah, I, th I think a really good point you made. I think this is actually what, 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 my, my idea. I just hadn't articulated it yet. But the the high achiever, the person that's going to actually achieve this financial independence, freedom, whatever you want to call it, isn't necessarily going to set the goal of, I once I get there, I'm going to retire. Their goal, they're going to have the goal of, I always want to expand and, and grow. Mm -hmm. And so I guess the, I guess the point is, is that if you're, if you're, if you are a high achiever, your goal most likely is not going to be, I want to, you know, re retire. Your, your goal is not going to be, you know, like Elon Musk and, all, and those, all the people you named, to continue growing and expanding, you know, forever, consistently, until you, you know, I guess die. And so I guess that, that, that was my question is, if, is, 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 or I guess the answer to the question is the type of individual that actually achieved the financial independence doesn't necessarily want to retire and quit their job, or sorry, retire and quit the business and just do nothing. Mm -hmm. The person that's going to actually, the person that is actually capable of achieving the financial freedom will, once they get to that point, just continue going. Continue going oh, yeah. and perhaps optimize the business so that they spend no time doing stuff they don't want to do and only time doing stuff they want to do. That, that certainly could be it. Yeah. And they might go on a year-long retreat or something, but the guarantee they'll be right back in the game, maybe starting a new business or, or something, because mm -hmm. that's, just, that's just how things work. I mean, I don't have to do another podcast episode ever. I mean, I, we could, this could be the last one, and that'll be it. And my business will be fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll be fine. But that's just not, not how I'm programmed. And... and um, you know, I just want to continue to grow and, and achieve, and that's what the high achievers do. Awesome. All right, so, so the next question is from one of the listeners, Robert. And he says, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get going in the multifamily and ran across some student condos one or two blocks from university. There are six of the 14 condos available. I don't see much upside appreciation unless the building is remodeled. It was built in the 1980s. Each unit has one vote for the HOA. If I were to acquire a majority of the 14, say eight of them, that put me in a position to force a remodel. I think the location is excellent, will always be rented, but the, up, but the outside is not appealing, and that would hurt the appreciation, in my opinion. But I guess the question is, if he has a majority of votes on the homeowner association, will he able, be able to force the... <laughs> HOA to repair the outside of the property. Yeah. Well, ultimately, well, disclaimer, I've never been in this position. So I am about to say what I think, but it is not based on personal firsthand experience. Uh, I would rec I would think the approach would be to uh, know what the HOA guidelines state, because whatever the bylaws say in a document, that's what is you know what they'll go by so then it's the question is can you or how do you get access to those bylaws for the homeowners association um, well ask for access maybe and then if 
they don't get it. It should be publicly available, but I'm not certain about that. So that, that would be my approach because uh, they might have something in there that yeah. says, you know, a majority, if you own eight, then, or if you own however many, then you can influence all the votes on the board, or it might be um, something different. Who knows? And they might not even let you have all, buy more than a certain amount of properties, too. Exactly. All right, so that was by Robert. David also had a question, and he said, asked, I guess we, we kind of actually answered this already in the podcast, but when getting a loan, what do you recommend for people who are new and don't have two years of tax returns, P&L statements, etc.? And I guess, I mean, the, 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 the lender that I used didn't, take, didn't need the profit and loss statements of the property. Well, I guess he's, I guess he's asking about the, uh, the property, so I guess that's a little bit of a different situation. So when you get a loan, what do you recommend for people who are new and don't have two years of personal tax returns and the property and loss statements for the property? Ah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, if you don't have tax, why don't you have tax yeah. returns? <laughs> are you not doing like, your taxes? Yeah, yeah, I don't know that answer. I would say just for the P&L statements, um, I, I'm guessing that maybe what he's asking is if the the property, if he hasn't owned the property long enough for, for, the, for that two years we are talking about earlier, where they're not going to take into account the, the income. And if that's the case, then you can find a lender like Guaranteed Rate that will use the income instantaneously and not have to wait oh, okay. two years. That might be the question. There you sure. go. Thank you, Theo. All right, so uh, I guess to, to, to wrap up, we wanted to acknowledge some some listeners mm -hmm. who I uh, left the review. And so we've got our, our latest review by a Legacy Driven. Mm -hmm. Do you want to read it? Do you want to read it? Yeah, read it. You've got a better voice than I do. <laughs> Yours is more authoritative. So Legacy Driven says, I say, I say be a sponge, and then and the title was, I, um, I'm a sponge. And he says, I say be a sponge because I've listened to this podcast for about six months, and the knowledge I've gained is hard to believe. Since listening, I've rented my home that I was going to sell. I'm getting positive cash flow too. I'm excited about acquiring more units and acquiring more knowledge with Joe along the way. Uh, I love it. Nice job, Legacy Driven, and congrats on renting out mm -hmm. the unit versus selling it. We really, unless we're going to do 1031 exchange, uh, acquire and keep and just hold on for the long run as much as possible. And so props to you for doing that and grateful that you are a listener. Um, and for best ever listeners, if you uh, write a review in iTunes. First off, that will be much appreciated, so thank you. Secondly, we're going to be reading one review on follow on Friday, and so we'll give you a shout out as well. And something that I believe is Robert Kiyosaki said, and this is paraphrasing, but he said he's a never lost money on a deal because he's never sell a deal. He just keeps, he holds everything and doesn't sell. And so, or he, I, I'm sure he does 1031. I bet he's done 1031 exchange. He's probably sold. I think this. I think it's like high exaggeration. Yeah, yeah. But imagine that. <laughs> that he would be exaggerating. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. And then finally, just want to talk about the uh, upcoming any upcoming exclusive interviews you you got. Yeah, I got a lot of questions from listeners for Julian Michaels. I'm going to be interviewing her next week. So uh, there's still time if you have questions. She is an entrepreneur, clearly. We're going to be focused on her entrepreneurial endeavors and really what we can um, learn from a high achiever like herself uh, who's succeeded um, with, within her chosen profession. And so this, this episode is going to be relatively quick. It's going to be about 15 minutes or so. Therefore... All the questions, except for maybe two or three, will be from you, best ever listeners. So continue to send questions at info, info at joefairless.com, or if you're watching this video in Facebook, then just comment below, and we'll, uh, I will do my best to include your question to Jillian Michaels when I interview her next week. Awesome. All right, well, best ever listeners, hope you have a wonderful rest of the day, and we'll talk to you tomorrow.